Hi everybody, welcome back to 10% True. Just before I let you get stuck into listening to Dave talk about flying the F-117 while it was still a black program, I wanted to let you know I've set up a Facebook group where you can go and post questions for my future interviewees. Link's in the description for this video. Please follow it, sign up, post your questions. You can see the interviews that I've got coming up in that Facebook group, um, and I'm happy to ask those questions on your behalf. Again, thanks for your support. If you like this video, subscribe, share, thumbs up. Speak to you next time. I'm going to tell you a little story, uh, which you will hopefully be able to complete. And I don't know if I told you this, um, I think maybe a little bit over email um, or, or maybe on the telephone. But when I was about 17, I was really lucky. I had a friend at school. His dad was a test pilot, mm -hmm. um, UTPS test pilot at Boscombe Down. And uh, my, f my friend was not really that interested in flying, but his dad found out that I was. And he arranged for me to have a hawk trip at, uh, at Boscombe. Uh -huh. So so we turned up and uh, he, as a sort of part of the process, took us to the office and I was going to go and have the medical and all this kind of stuff. But but before that, he went to his office and he said, um, he said, now look, there's there's a guy I share the office with. Um, and he's got a special plaque and it's got something on it. And for God's sake, if he comes in, don't ask him any questions about it. Uh, so we walk into the office and uh, and I see this plaque and, it's, and I'm sure it was a plaque. It might have been an ornament. I can't remember which one it was, but it was an odd sort of faceted shaped thing. And underneath there was an inscription that said um, to commemorate a very special occasion, and there was a, there was a date. Um, and of course, the person that he shared the office with was you. Uh, <laughs> you. You weren't there, so I so I never met you. But that was about twenty eight years ago. So I'm hoping uh, now you'll be able to sort of complete the circle for us and, and tell us what that uh, what, what that odd odd thing was. Yeah, certainly. So um, this started in April 1986 when I'd been on a squadron about four months after finishing EZPS. I had a phone call one night from the squadron commander, Colin Crookshanks, uh, who said, Dave, are you available to go to the States for a month in about two weeks' time? Yeah, right. We're off to see the chief of the air staff tomorrow. So we get on this train and um, we knew it was to go and fly something, but we weren't quite sure what. And there was a lot in the media at the time about the F-19 stealth fighter, but also about, uh, it was known the Americans operating MiGs out in the Nevada desert. Um, and so we went to see Chief of the Air Staff, and he had been out on a red flag visit to Nellis um, just the month before, and had been spirited away one day and taken to Tonopah and um, shown the 117s put in the sim and had to fly the sim. And then they said, right, there's an offer here for two RAF test pilots to come and do an evaluation of the F-117. <clears throat> so he, the CS came back and he contacted uh, somebody who's known as a controller of aircraft. He was an RAF three-star. <clears throat> um, and said, find me two test pilots to go to the States in two weeks' time without saying why. Uh, and the controller of aircraft, his previous personal staff officer had been Colin and so he thought you know he knew a test pilot so he passed it on to um to Colin and so we went and then CS told us what had happened and then said right there you are off to the states and the, the plan was for us to do five sorties each in the uh, the 117 so we in those days we traveled everywhere on the VC 10s from Bryce Norton uh, but this whole thing was done under wraps. So we actually went to British Airways to Washington. Uh, we were met there. And then we spent a week in Washington basically being in brief to the whole program, um, mainly in uh, the Pentagon. But we did have some meetings in the White House with uh, some people. So that was a, an in brief on the whole thing. Um, and it, bear in mind, this was the height of the Ronald Reagan, Maggie Thatcher special relationship. Uh, and the... the the rationale behind it all was that it was the early days of the Eurofighter development. And the Americans wanted us to know what the state of the art was with respect to low observable technology, both radar cross-section and infrared. Uh, and that was the whole deal. It was to say, hey, guys, this is what's possible. So um, don't blink yourself to what can be done. Um, from there, the, the decision was that what we do was to really go through the training conversion program to the airplane. So it was not a flight test environment. It was an operation evaluation, if you like. Um, and at the time, it was about halfway through the production run on the airplane. So there was one squadron operating at Tonopah, but the training unit and test units were all at Groom Lake. And so we went to Groom Lake and did the full ground school, um, all the academic training on the airplane. We then went to Tonopah, 
and did all the simulator training that the squadron crews did. And it was an eight sortie conversion to the aeroplane. And we elected not to do the instrument flying side. But then we, the, the five sorties were largely built around the profiles they were doing. At the time, the squadrons obviously only flew at night because it was still a completely uh, top secret aeroplane. Um, but all the training flying was done by day, and the testing was out of Groom Lake. We threw in a few other things that we wanted to do, like being British low flying, which wasn't part of the mission of the aeroplane, um, and flying it with the order pilot not engaged during attack profiles. Um, and so we did the flying out of Groom Lake. We then went back and we outbriefed uh, in the Pentagon, a fairly high level, with Secretary of State for Defence Weinberger, head of the Air Force. Um, and the chief scientist at the Pentagon at the time, came home, wrote a report, which once it was written and signed, there were only five people who could read it. We weren't on the list. So one of these ironies, you write a document and they're not allowed to read. Um, and yeah, so I was a 30-year-old flight lieutenant going off flying this aeroplane that didn't exist from a base that didn't exist, working for the chief of the air staff. And I knew then that it was highly unlikely in the whole of my working life I was ever going to get another opportunity that was going to top that. So, so when you and Colin uh, were recruited into this then, did he tell you what it was you were going to go and fly? I mean, did he say, there's this thing, it's called the F-117, here's a picture of it? He didn't show us a picture, but yes, he said it was 117, and, and obviously there were no pictures that he had access to. So his description was interesting. He said it's a highly swept delta, looks like a bit like an arrowhead with faceted surfaces on it, um, and, you know, and most bizarre shaped twin fins. So it's just a verbal description that we had from him. And it was interesting because he had not been in briefed about Groom Lake at all. So all he knew of was the fact that they were only flying at, flying at night out of Tonopah. Bar. I think from when we talked years ago, you said that you did an A7 checkout. Not, not, not an A7 checkout, but what they actually had on the squadron, they had A7 aeroplanes as shadow aeroplanes. So they could exercise procedures and deployments in the open world. So all the pilots on the squadron then were dual qualified on the A7. Um, and talking to them out there, we knew that there was a two-seat A7, so it's a case of any chance of a trip in the A7. So it was really the opportunity to fly the A7. Nothing specifically involved with that, but one part of the conversion training was that somebody had said that flying the 117 on the approach is like flying an F-15 flapless. So they all had the opportunity to go down to Luke and fly flapless approaches in the F-15. So that was part of the deal. We went down to Luke, but we were under pain of death not to ask for flapless approaches because it would compromise where we were coming from. So we went off doing supersonic intercepts and things, which was great fun. I, I think that was what I was, I was misremembering. I think you said it was at Luke that somebody there said, hey, somebody flagged something and said, hey, there's the two RAF guys here. What, what are they doing? Yeah, there was an RAF exchange pilot um, at Luke instructing on the F-15. And we got down there and it was a total surprise to him that we were there. Um, and he was about to go off and phone the embassy and, and sort of say that it wasn't on to have visitors there that he hadn't been in briefed on. Um, we took him on one side and said, the embassy don't actually know we're here. So, um, yeah, he was kind of kept out of the loop and just asked him to not say anything to anybody the fact that we were there. What were so, so when you went to, to Washington, the Pentagon, is that when you first saw a picture of the aeroplane? Yes, it was. Um, there was a major who'd been on the squadron when it first formed who was there, so he in briefed us, showed us a picture, um, briefed us on Groom Lake, and there were obviously programs that we had to sign the non disclosure um, security do uh, documentation on. So, what did you think when you, when you first walked into a hangar and saw it in the flesh? Um, we'd obviously seen the pictures that it was. A very unusual, bizarre shape, but we'd obviously ask questions about where the design came from. And it was quite interesting that the mathematics behind it was from a Russian paper that had been discovered by Lockheed. Uh, and the computational powers at the time with respect to radar cross section were limited to two dimensions, which is why it was faceted and put together. So it's only when it came to the B2 subsequently that computational powers had developed enough to have three dimensional predictions on radar cross-section. What did it feel like then to go to the secret base and see the secret aircraft and, and be part of this sort of other world? How, how did, emotionally, how do, you, how do you feel about that? Um, in some ways, it was 
quite surreal. I mean, you it's a huge, huge privilege and that very, very few people ever get an opportunity like that. But one of the things of, of going out to space, we went out on a Monday morning and came back on a Friday afternoon, was that it was an airbase. And so you had all the normal personnel that you have on any other airbase, cleaners, cooks. Um, and so it was a whole culture. And what was really impressive was that nothing ever leaked about the airplane at all before it went to the grey world at the end of 1988. We talked previously, again, when, when you were telling me the story offline years ago, I think, um, about some of the deception techniques that were employed to hide the fact from other Americans who were, you know, part of the F-117 program or, or sort of part of the black world that there were two British guys flying the 117. Can you, can you describe some of those? Yeah, one of the things when we inbriefed was they said that the cover story for who we were was that we were um, CIA pilots. Uh, and we did say, OK, this is a rhetorical question, but how many British pilots do the CIA actually employ? We don't want an answer, but just think about it, because other people, it will go through their mind. They're, mm, yeah, interesting. What do you suggest we use? And we actually said, well, why don't we just say that we used to be British test pilots? And then even stuff we're doing at the moment, we can just talk about in the past tense, which even after a few beers, you can still do that. Um, and that was it. And, and it was... The whole culture about it was very good because obviously the squadron was headquartered at 4450th at Nellis. Um, and if people bumped into old friends and then said, oh, hi, hi, yeah, what are you doing here? People just say, I'm on the 4450th. And that was the conversation stopped. Um, weekends, we socialised with some of the people we worked with and with their families. And the standard cover story was that we were there for a red flag planning meeting. And because there was RAF involvement at Nellis and people staying in, uh, in Las Vegas, and it was fairly easy to use that as a, as a cover and nobody would bat an eyelid. Am I correct in remembering that when you flew for at least some of those flights, somebody else did your radio calls for you? So there was yeah, what happened was, because, it, because there were no dual control ones, then all the training sorties were chased by an instructor in an A7. Um, but on, and the call signs, rather, all the pilots then had their own individual bandit call signs. But again, rather than compromise the fact that we come into the program, we used the call signs from people who are on leave. So I was the other bandit 168. Um, and sorty one started up, checked in with the um, with the chase and called the tower frequency for clearance to taxi. You know, bandits 168 request taxi with a British accent. And apparently the telephone system on the base just melted down completely. Um, and the colonel was very philosophical about it. And he was anticipating this happening. So thereafter, what we did was just a very quick check-in with the chase. And then the chase did all of the transmissions pretending to be us with an American accent and tried to change his voice for his own transmissions, even when we went to the tanker um, to refuel. So he would actually call the tanker on our behalf. You, you mentioned that you did the your sort of training, your checkout at, at Groom during the day. Yeah. How do you do that and not big compromise are you doing some kind of rapid climb to altitude are you just flying in really tight circles so you stay within their airspace how do you do no that? i mean there was an operating area there where basically it was a prohibited area for people to go there there was a case of somebody who'd had a mine up in the hills overlooking the base who'd been there from before the base had been built so he just had to be signed into the program so that if there were anybody any people around who were going to be able to see anything they were signed into a secrecy agreement. Um, the, the one critical thing we had, obviously, it was completely restricted airspace, but was from the satellite overflights, the Soviet satellites. So we had all that information, and we had to make sure that we were back in the hangar before there was a satellite overflight. Uh, and that was one of the big considerations. Did they reveal everything to you? Was there anything that they... <clears throat> sort of prevented you from really getting into no not the slightest they were very open there were four different security levels for people on the squadron and we were cleared to the top security level the same as the squadron commanders and we had full access to all the flight test reports on the airplane and whatever we wanted to see from the flight test program then we just say can we go into the vault and they'd lock us in the vault and we'd read what we wanted to uh, and when we finished we'd, we'd call somebody and they'd come and let us out the obvious question then becomes um, you come back to the UK. Uh, I mean, I'd like to get back to talking about how you how the aeroplane flew and what you thought sure. of it, but, but just sort of going forward in time then, you come back to the UK. How have you managed to 
store the data points that you've learned because uh, you can't remember it all. No, that was an interesting one. We discussed it with them and they were happy for us to make notes and write numbers and words on a piece of paper, providing they were completely non-attributable so that people couldn't work out what aeroplane it was, where it was or anything else. So that was the basis. We made notes, which obviously meant something to us. And it was our major task when we came back to write the report. Um, the interesting thing was, with the security level that the report was going to be at, then the facilities that we were supposed to use to write it, of Gaussian screened offices and things, we didn't have those available. So if we'd have asked for those to be built, it would have got a lot of suspicion from a lot of people of what was going on. So we did it totally under the radar of having a locked safe in, um, in Colin's office that only we had access to. Um, and it was done on very early word processes, three and a half inch floppies, and that were all kept locked in the safe. And when we'd finished it all, then we destroyed everything we had. And it is an interesting philosophical point that to exercise all the really high security procedures can compromise what you've actually been doing. And it's often easier to be discreet and subtle about it. Before we talk about the actual flying then, who, who were the fine people that that report was readable by? And, and what was the value to the UK ultimately and if the if the distribution was so limited? Um, the five people, as I recall, it was the Prime Minister, uh, Defence Minister, Chief of Defence Staff, Chief of the Air Staff, and probably the Foreign Secretary. Um, I think with the five, the whole uh, there are a few things that came out of it. Potentially, we could have bought some, uh, and obviously at the time they'd have had to be based at Tonopah. Um, it was really again looking at what the technological capabilities were at the time, so that information could be with the right procedures released to the people who were looking at low observable technology on. Eurofighter and other platforms um, but it was all part of the special relationship that we had um, and it, it could have been taken further one of the things that obviously we looked at were our knowledge of pre-planned operations because it was not a target of opportunity airplane it was 2,000 pound laser guided bombs um, with, against known target coordinates that were entered into normally on the ground before you went um, and the capabilities of the airplane obviously improved as time went on but this was fairly early days it was only five years after the airplane first flew um, so that there were those looking at how it fitted in with current RF operating one of our big thoughts was because it was on a, an infrared designation system then that doesn't see through cloud and so that the still Cold War Europe then it was going to be quite limited in Europe in the theatre there. Uh, but one of the things we recommended was establishing an exchange for an RF pilot, which was established. Um, and Graham Waddell was the first person to go out there. I think there were about 10 people did it up until when the aeroplane went out of service. What was the mission planning software like then? Um, for the time, it was very capable. If you think that my experience up to that point with digital nav attack systems was the original Jaguar system that had an 8K processor. <clears throat> um, I had flown the F-18 as my end of course exercise at ETPS, but a very early standard of it. So yes, it was very capable to produce a mission to then load into the system. And I think one of the really interesting things was at the time, most of the gimbaled inertial navigation systems had a one mile per hour accuracy. And this had a system called Spin Genes from the B-52H, which was a genuine 0.1 of a mile per hour pointing accuracy. And that was one of the most stunning things um, that the airplane actually had that I really hadn't come across before. You said that you opted to skip the instrument part of the uh, yeah. conversion course. My memory is that a couple of, um, they lost a couple at night, didn't they, through Spatial D? They did, and it was interesting. We... One comment was that it would be nice to have flown one of the sorties at night just to actually look at it in the full operating environment with the cockpit lighting and everything else. Um, it was a strange living cycle that the crews were working on in those days at Tonopah. They go out on a Monday morning, come home on a Friday evening, but all the flying was done by night. So you had the circadian rhythm shift from normal working hours at the weekend uh, and then changing over completely for four nights before we then went home again. That was quite possibly a contributory factor. It was an aeroplane that was flown once in the cruising for the attacks, primarily in the autopilot. Um, manual climb-outs generally, certainly manual approaches and landings. 
um, but the mission profile and the tax were flown auto part engaged. So how did you approach the, the task of, of um, evaluating this aeroplane then? Did you turn up with a set of missions that you knew or test points you knew you wanted to um, sort of explore? How do, you, how do you do that? Not particularly because if you think that the training syllabus was to prepare people to go and fly operational mission profiles, then all the operational aspects of the training syllabus were going to show us really all that we needed to know. So there were one or two additional bits about if the autopilot failed the workload associated with manually flying the aeroplane whilst carrying out the attack. We did go and look at low flying just because that was what we did um, in those days. Uh, We did some formation flying, which was part of the syllabus, but it's quite interesting in those days they were concerned about visual cues of formating on another 117 because of the shape. So we formated against the A7. Uh, We went to air-to-air refueling, and interesting, all the air-to-air refueling Colin and I had done up to then was probe and drogue, the British and the US Navy system, whereas this was off the boom off a KC-135, which he'd never done before, but it was a case of a brief, go and formate and off you go and uh, and do it. So those were about the only extra bits that we really said that we wanted to look at. Was it, was it a pilot's aeroplane then? It was an interesting aeroplane because it had um, F-16 flight control computers, um, largely F-18 avionics. Uh, and so it was a G-command system with angle of attack. Feedback. So it flew like any of the modern fly-by-wire type aeroplanes. So it was quite straightforward there. I think probably the Biggest thing was the wing plan form and trying to land it because it's quite high speed, it's about 170 or 175 knots, I think, on the approach. Um, but the airfields, Groom Lake's four and a half thousand feet above sea level, Turner Pass five and a half at high temperatures as well. So your actual true airspeed and therefore your ground speed is quite high. So when you come down the approach, you, you get this cushion of air called ground effect. So you had to really try and fly the aeroplane positively onto the ground. Otherwise, it would just float forever down the, down the runway. So that was one thing that was slightly different. I think for a combat type aeroplane, then the solid top to the canopy meant that if you had more than about 45 degrees of bank on, you had no capability to look into the turn, whereas normally you fly through the top of the canopy. And that was probably the most striking thing about flying it at low level. Then you couldn't really put on bank unless you really knew it was clear ahead because you couldn't look into the turn. But that was a pretty straightforward aeroplane to fly. What what was the RCS for it then? Do you remember? Um, I'm not prepared. I do. But I'm not prepared to say numbers. I think one of the things, though, is that radar cross-section is a function of the frequency of the radar. And there tends to be this um, concept, if if people haven't really studied it, that you have an RCS for a radar. And it's frequency dependent. It also depends on what aspect of the aeroplane. But it will vary from aeroplane to aeroplane, especially when it's very small. So at that time, all the aeroplanes coming off the production line were flown through a profile by the operational test guys there against sensors at Groom Lake to measure the RCS of the aeroplane, so that the ones that had the best were the Cat A aeroplanes that were the prime ops ones, Um, Cat B were the reserve ops, and Cat C went to the training uh, and test units. So were they all hand-built? Is that, does that um, explain the, the difference? I think that's the way the skunk works largely. When, I mean, how much of it was machine production, how much of a hand-built, I don't know because we, at the time, had no contact with the Lockheed guys at all. Okay. Did they know you were doing it? Um, no, they didn't. It was one of the things on base that our presence was... There were attempts to keep it to the minimum number of people in you. So socially, where we ate, the bar there, there was a training unit, there was the operational test guys, but um, Lockheed worked from another facility and all the the MIG side was elsewhere. So at the time, we didn't mix. I mean, since then, I've got to know um, some of the Lockheed guys involved at the time very well. But it was only when the aeroplane came out into the open that I could talk to them about what we'd actually done. You mentioned MIGs. Uh, when you went to Tonopar, of course, you were... Um, read into the uh, constant peg program. Yes. What was? Did you get to go and visit the hangars? Did you get? I mean, were they kept separate from you? Uh, they were completely separate. Um, it was surreal of thinking of MiG twenty ones and, and MiG twenty threes as the enemy of just watching them break into the circuit and land. We went to the um, the Red Eagles crew room and talked to the guys over there and had a look at a lot of the memorabilia. But we never went into the 
hangar and looked at the airplane because we were really into the program as far as its existence went because we were going to see it. Um, but we never went to see the airplanes. When you come back from a, an experience like that, how do you... Um, because I guess I would just be sitting thinking, well, that is just really cool and I want more of that. You know, yeah. I, I, it's, it, but you, and it's almost as though you're coming back to something that, that isn't humdrum because you're a test pilot, you're flying jets and you're doing cool stuff, but it's, it's on a different level. Um, it is. Um, it was a one-off opportunity. At the time, I felt that when we were trying to set up the exchange shore, I'd like to have gone and done it. But I mean, in hindsight, it was finding it for four weeks, see, out on a Monday, back on a Friday. Would I really want to do it for three years? Not sure. It was a strange way of life out there. Um, and the guys didn't fly that much. I think Graham only did about 250 hours in his, his three-year tour. So it was a strange way of life, not that much flying. And actually quite a restricted mission. Um, but obviously they all flew the A7 as well. But uh, yeah, very high, I say high profile, um, a very important program um, that was there and a lot of pride behind it. There was immense pride behind the whole program. It was an incredibly successful airplane for what it actually did. But it was all part past the job. I had other interesting things to go on. And uh, <laughs> yes, it may have been 34 years ago, but it's, it's as clear as it was yesterday, all the things that we did. One of the things that is uh, interesting about the Red Eagles, because uh, of course I've, I've worked with those guys quite a bit to write the story, is that they took photographs of themselves in front of the aircraft. They all went into the vault. Yeah. And they had hoped that when the program was declassified, those <coughs> pictures would come out. Did you get any pictures of you in front of the 117? Or um, What happened was, rather than their sort of first trip being hosed down by the fire truck, we did it off the last trip. So there were photographs that went into the vault. Um, and then when the program came out into the open, then I did try to get friends who were still involved to find the photographs, but they never materialised. So how many hours did you get? How much time? Um, flew five sorties, six and a half hours. And that was over two weeks? <clears throat> the flying was over two weeks. So we sort of in-briefed um, the first week. Second week was ground school and the sims. And then the fly. I think the flying was all over probably a, a period of about a calendar week. Um, and then we out-briefed through the Pentagon. There was one day we flew two sorties and it was quite interesting. But that day, I'd flown the two sorties in different airframes, both about an hour and a quarter, and was back in the crew and finished for the day by 10.30. Dave, the other thing you've done quite a bit then of, uh, is, is warbird flying. Yes. Um, how did you get into that? What, what are you doing? Um, what do you prefer, jets or warbird? Yeah, <laughs> interesting one. Um, I think like a lot of pilots, when I learned to fly and was uh, in the early days, I always used to say, one day I'll fly a Spitfire, hoping that I, um, that I would. And then I was on A squadron at Boscombe Down, uh, came up from leave middle of 87, and on the crew notice board was a letter saying, wanted pilots to fly World War II airplanes. And it was from the property developer, Charles Church, who was starting up a flying museum at Roundwood near Popham on the uh, A33 between Farnborough and... Um, Boscombe Down. Uh, and he was looking for pilots with more than 500 hours on tailwheel airplanes, 100 hours of which were on something heavier than the chipmunk or a tiger moth, um, and were prepared to give up 50% of their free time. And I wrote to him and said, this is me. I've displayed the buccaneer and the hunter. Um, I've got about 70 hours in the chipmunk, two hours in the beaver. Um, so I haven't got the experience you're looking for, but I'd love to come and fly for you. And he sort of said, okay, we'll come along for a chat and a cup of coffee, which I did one evening. And it was a case of, right, you're in. <laughs> and that was it. And the rest of the say is history. So I started um, flying for Charles in 88. He was very sadly killed in a Spitfire accident um, in 89. But from having done that, I then had the opportunity to start flying for the Harvard Formation Team at North Weald. Um, and then it kind of rolled on from there. So there was the Messerschmitt 109 Black Six that was owned by MOD, but operated by the Imperial War Museum. So I flew that and then started flying for the fighter collection at Duxford, who, it's, uh, who I mainly fly for now. Black Six, you mentioned earlier in our conversation. Yeah. And um, did that airplane, I know it crashed or it was crashed. Um, did that airplane get written off? No, it didn't. It was rebuilt after the accident, although the engine was not fully rebuilt. And it was basically rebuilt to flying condition. But ironically, um, that was slated to be its last flight anyway when it had the accident. <clears throat> it was 
originally um, the intention was it had been promised in perpetuity to the Royal Air Force Museum. Uh, and a chap called Russ Snadden got the contract to rebuild it. Um, and he and a team started rebuilding it and then asked permission to continue the rebuild to put it back to flying condition. And that was granted for a limited flying life. Uh, and when it came up to uh, starting the flying, it took 19 years to rebuild it. When it came up to flying, then a limited flying life was determined to be three years. Now, we had a few technical problems with the aeroplane in the first couple of years. So we said, oh, we haven't had a full season. And we managed to stretch it to, to seven seasons over six years. Um, but that was supposed to be its last public display. And then it was going to go into the RF Museum at Hendon anyway. But it was, the team did rebuild it to fully airworthy standard. Um, but there was no political will or decision to uh, fly it again. You said it was difficult on takeoff and landing. Can you describe yes. why? Um, Interesting design that the undercarriage legs are attached to the fuselage for strength. Um, but then to get them to retract outwards into the wing, the wheels have to go forward of the main spar. So you end up geometrically with the wheels towing in. So it's a bit like snowplow skiing, if you like. They're both towing in. Um, so it's a narrow track undercarriage, a tow in on the wheels, and a high center of gravity. So if it starts to yaw off at all, you, it is just like snowplow skiing. You're loading up the outside wheel, which just exacerbates it. Um, and the only way of controlling it on the ground, on takeoff with power, you can use the rudder, but on landing, then you can't. You've just got the brake. And the brakes weren't that effective, narrow track undercarriage. So it made the directional control very difficult. It had a lockable tailwheel. So that was the one thing that gave you something to keeping straight. But yeah, one of the more difficult airplanes on takeoff and landing that I've flown. You fly the is it the Bearcat? The no, I've never flown the Bearcat. Um, it's, it's, if I had to have an aeroplane at the top of my list of things I want to fly, it'd be the Bearcat. But no, I fly the Wildcat a lot. Um, when we had the Hellcat, I used to fly that a lot as well. And that was that was probably the nicest of the World War II aeroplanes to fly that I've ever flown the Hellcat. Absolutely delightful. What, what are their foibles? What are the things that you really have to be careful of with them? I think um, one of the main ones with them relates to crosswinds that a lot of them came from the days where if they're naval airplanes, the ship steamed into wind. Um, airfields were round and circular, so that you didn't have much of a crosswind issue. So they can be quite cliff-edged. Some of them have, like the Mustang in particular, have some quite nasty stall characteristics. Uh, and it was in the days of if an airplane stalled, the pilot dealt with it. The concept of safety and stall warning and um, certification was somewhat down the road. So some of them do have nasty stall characteristics. Issues with some of them is engine overheating on the ground on some of the liquid-cooled ones because radiators generate drag. So if you want performance, you don't want big radiators, which means that on the ground after you start it up, it's going to overheat fairly quickly. We touched on this a couple of times in this conversation already and um, previously on the phone, the idea of jumping into multiple types of aeroplane, yeah. being comfortable doing that, having the experience and um, the ability to do that. What are the techniques that you use to make sure that you can you know go from one airplane to another without um, inadvertently remembering you know the wrong thing and and i guess that's particularly true around these world war ii fighters where you're getting very few hours i would imagine yeah and, and often in display you will jump literally from the cockpit of one to another <clears throat> you've got to develop a personal protocol that works for you so i have some personal notes that i've made of the really essential numbers that you need to know uh, and I will have an A5 piece of card with the limits and the relevant numbers on one side for one aeroplane and then on the other side for the other. And I will jump in the other aeroplane and I will sit there and I will read it. Um, completely switched off to anything else for five minutes. So you have to come up with a strategy that works for you on mental preparation and how to deal with it. Some of the other aeroplanes, like let's say the Hunter um, or the Hawk that have been flying for over 40 years, then... Yes, I'll have a quick scan through the checklists and the limits periodically, but that is not something which tends to be particularly perishable for knowledge. But with the warbirds, especially as you say with the low time, even if I'm flying something one weekend and the next, I'll probably dump it from my memory after the one weekend and then I'll prepare for it again before the next weekend. But other people probably have different strategies for how to deal with it. Is the licensing through the Civil Aviation Authority, is that done um, 
per aircraft type, or do you have some kind of catch-all the license that means you can fly anything it, within a weight category? Um, it depends because all of the single-engine World War II fighters are classed as single-engine piston, so it's the same as a Cessna 150 or anything else. So from a licensing point of view, I do it on a single-engine piston rating. Obviously, there's display authorizations which come according to horsepower category, so less than 200, 200 to 600, or, or greater than 600. Um, other types, the jets are on tight rating exemptions, and things like the DC-3 is a tight rating exemption. So it does vary, but the big filter in some ways is the insurance on the aeroplane, because the insurers will want a certain amount of overall experience, certain amount of recency um, on type check rides within the organisation, so that Every organisation will have different requirements um, and it is the, the insurance market actually that provides the, the filter to a lot of it. Do you, do you have your own insurance? Is that paid for by a TFC? Or a um, it depends from operator to operator, but normally it's what's called seat cover. So that when you're flying an aeroplane for another operator, then all the aspects uh, are not against you personally, unless you are grossly negligent or um, reckless that it comes under the insurance on the aeroplane. But not all insurance policies are like that. So it's one of those things where I think for me going flying aeroplanes, for anybody, I'm very interested in the engineering standards um, and also the insurance aspects on the aeroplane. There's obviously a long list of very cool things that you do for a living and you've done <laughs> over a long period of time. One of the things that I think is coolest is, is the work you do for Martin Baker. Can you describe... Yeah. Yeah, essentially, Martin Baker run two uh, highly modified meteors for rejection seat testing. So all the testing is done on um, static fire from the ground or on a rocket sled at Langford Lodge in Northern Ireland. But then eventually they'll do end-to-end checks by firing the seats out of a meteor. And from the, the early days of the company, they've used meteors. Originally Mark III, these are what are called Mark T7.5Ss. So they were built as T7s. Um, they've got the big fin and rudder off the F8 and the Night Fighters, uh, and the S is the, the modification. Um, and I have learned the aeroplanes used to be owned by a company that I worked for. We're actually military registered when I started flying them, but it's now transitioned. The aeroplanes are now owned by Martin Baker, run as civilian G Reg aeroplanes. Um, it's a huge, huge privilege to have the opportunity to fly. It's a delightful aeroplane to fly, um, and it's a, it a huge privilege to be able to do so. Am I right in thinking then that you, you will fly a profile, so you'll fly along, you're in the front seat of the, the Meteor in the back seat, they have a test dummy, an instrumented dummy with a live ejection seat? Yes, yes they do. You fly and it, along and, and then... fly out and you make the switches live and pull the trigger and out seat goes. Do you pull the trigger? The pilot pulls the trigger. I must have. No, I, I mean, I just help them out a lot of times. So I haven't actually fired any seats out um, for them yet because they have a full-time chief pilot uh, and so it's just to help him out because they have two aeroplanes and sometimes we take them both around. But yes, it's all done by positioning in the front. The low altitude firings are done um, over the airfield at Chalgrove, where they operate from. The medium level ones are typically done in um, a range. Caso in France has been used mainly in the past for uh, for firing the seats there. Wow. So you're, um, you know, not trying to get too personal, but you did mention your age uh, yeah. a while ago. So you're, you're sort of um, in your mid-60s. Yep. Um, what does the future hold for you? Where, where will you... You know, in the next uh, five, ten years, where would you like to to go? What would you like to be doing? Still flying, retiring? No, still flying. I mean, I'm not the retiring type. I've I've got a very low boredom threshold, um, and I have to have lots of intellectual challenges to go. I still enjoy flying as much as I ever have done. So the biggest issue, frankly, with getting older is is keeping your medical of uh, of trying to keep fit. But from a licensing point of view, there's, there's some of the flying and have to stop doing based on age on the military registered airplanes, but on all the others, if I keep my medical, then there's no reason why I shouldn't carry on flying exam at the moment. So, so do you think you'll have a last hurrah? Do you think you'll take something, go and do a low level down the muck loop, um, the low fly zone in, <coughs> uh, in Wales uh, for your final military flight? No, I mean, it's quite interesting that um, there's a lot of people who are very against last flights because there have been some interesting um, issues. I did, because I actually left the RAF 20 years ago. Uh, and I did do a last trip in the Air Force. I did it in the Jaguar and took some bombs off, bombing on Pembrey and over around Wales and 
high speed fly pass down the airfield. And I thought, you know, this is all the things that I will never ever do again in an airplane. I went off to the airlines, uh, but I lost my job after 9 11. So I actually went back as a civilian doing the job I used to do in the Air Force, flying the same airplane, doing the same thing. So never say never. But no, I think I've been so fortunate that there's nothing um, that would be sensible legal appropriate to go and do like that I, I think it's one of those things where i would certainly like to uh, and, and the hunter's the one military airplane i fly or military registered airplane i still fly um mainly i would like to do i would like to be current on the airplane when i reach a point when i can no longer fly it so i sort of flown it through to um to the end of when i possibly could but i think yes it whatever there will be some sort of a last trip but i'm not going to go um, go bananas on it do you have a bucket list then of aeroplane types that you want to fly that you're going to try and get to fly? Um, or, you know, conversely, is there a type of aeroplane that you really wanted to fly you know you will, will never get to fly? Um, I tell you, the Grumman Bearcat is definitely top of my list of aeroplanes that I would like to fly. Um, there are lots of aeroplanes from the past I would like to have flown. Uh, and top of the list from the whole history of aviation would have been the X-15. That would have been definitely my, my top aeroplane. Um, but no, I've been, I've been just so fortunate that um i think yeah it, it tends to be the world war ii types that still fascinate me most because they are all about a man controlling an airplane it's all basic you're connected to the controls where it goes what it does is down to you nothing computerized nothing electronic uh, and that to me is is where i get the real satisfaction out of flying dave thanks very much my pleasure thank you cheers